Welcome back to my channel for another execution method video. Today we're going to be covering the one modern method that has the longest history in the US and is still offered on the menu today. It has the lowest rate of going wrong, but when it does, it is traumatic. I'm talking about the firing squad. We are going to break down this method step by step and I'm also going to give you a vivid visual on how this might feel. My content may be upsetting to some, viewer discretion advised. The firing squad is not exclusive to the US, it has been used in times of war and as an execution method all over the world. In the US, in modern times, the target was and is always secured above the heart. But in the case of war crimes, the target was occasionally the back of the head or neck and was done in close range. There are several reasons why the heart is the ideal target. For one, a shot to the head is not a guaranteed kill shot. The only surefire way to kill is to destroy the brainstem located at the base of the skull. That is the part of the brain that controls life-sustaining reflexes like breathing. There is a risk of the prisoner falling into a coma or living outright. If the execution is not completed all over again, that person would become a huge drain on the prison's medical resources and funds. Also, the state has become mostly concerned with how executions look to the general public. It isn't so much about whether it's truly humane, but whether it looks humane. They tend to shy away from deaths that are messy and might traumatize the people involved. As you can imagine, having two to four rifle cartridges unloaded into the head from 25 feet away would create a horror show of exploding brain matter, blood, and bone. It would also certainly disfigure the prisoner so much so that they would be unrecognizable. You might be thinking, why not shoot at point-blank range to guarantee death? And the answer to that is because there would be no way to protect the shooter from psychological consequences. Whether current methods of protection actually work or not, they would be completely removed in this scenario. Historically, one or more are provided a blank. This is supposed to keep them from knowing who is responsible for the fatal shots. Of course, if you've ever fired a rifle before, you probably know that the recoil is enough to tell you whether or not you are shooting a cartridge or a blank. It would be too dangerous for multiple shooters to fire at point blank range so the solitary person would know without a shadow of doubt that they killed a person. It is also thought to be more traumatic to shoot a person in close range as opposed to 25, 30 feet away. The traditional process of the firing squad began at daybreak. The prisoner was beckoned from their cell at first light on their set execution date. They were led out to the prison yard and were oftentimes greeted by a large roaring crowd. In the old days, there were less requirements about who could witness an execution. Aside from family members of the victim and prisoner, it was first come, first serve. The day prior to the execution, the prisoner was granted a few hours to spend with approved family members, typically a spouse or children. In the evening, they were given their last meal and spiritual counsel. Occasionally, they were allowed to speak to members of the press. Once positioned in the appropriate place, either on chair or standing, the prisoner's order of execution is recited. They are then offered their last rites and allowed the chance to speak their final words. About 25 feet away is a line of people outfitted with Winchester rifles. They are not visible to the witnesses or the condemned. Sometimes they're situated behind a brick wall with holes. In the infancy of this execution, they were oftentimes hidden away in a shed. Next, a hood is placed over the prisoner's head and a small target secured to their chest right over the heart. In most cases, it was simply pinned to the prison jumpsuit or shirt. Fun fact, in select prisons, inmates were allowed to wear clothing of their choice during their execution. Next comes the dreaded countdown. The marshal is in charge of giving the shooters their cue, which is typically a countdown from three or a ready, aim, fire. On fire or one, all five shooters fire the rifles aiming for the target. The hope is that one or more cartridges will cause the heart to rupture. It is still not an immediate death, but it is the quickest of all modern methods. The heart stops beating and massive internal blood loss leads to exsanguination in seconds. The prison physician will approach the body and check for signs of life. If everything went well, they will also call the official time of death. These days, this method hasn't changed too much. There has only been a few firing squad executions carried out since the 70s, but two inmates are currently awaiting this fate in South Carolina. Richard Bernard Moore will likely be the next, and it could take place sometime this year. It was initially scheduled for this past spring, but the state Supreme Court put it on hold. Richard was given a pretty grim choice. It was either this or the electric chair. He was clear about the fact that he wanted neither, but the electric chair is the greatest of two evils. When his execution takes place, it will happen inside of a death chamber instead of a prison yard. There will only be three shooters who are positioned behind a brick wall 15 feet away from his metal chair, one with a blank. 
The state recently spent over $50,000 on renovations so that their death chamber could double for firing squad and electric chair executions. In modern times, all firing squad executions have gone exactly the way that they were supposed to, but there was one botched firing squad execution in 1879 and it was absolutely brutal. The day was May 16th, and in late morning, convicted murderer Wallace Wilkerson was ushered from his cell in Utah and brought to the corner of the prison yard. He strutted out wearing a dark suit to match his black mustache. He found himself in this unfortunate situation after really losing his cool during a card game. He was apparently not a graceful loser and attacked and killed his opponent. The day before his death date, he spent a few hours with his wife. He assured her of his innocence, but also promised that he would go out of this world with his head held high. Unfortunately, he was naive to the fact that his death would go on to become the blueprint of what not to do during an execution. Wallace shook hands with some guards and law enforcement. Wallace's order of execution was recited. He was then given the chance to say his final words and he proceeded to give an entire speech. He spoke of the fact that he had no ill will towards anyone with the exception of one witness at his trial, very specific. He praised law enforcement and made his intentions clear about refusing to wear the hood. He closed out by saying, I give you my word, I intend to die like a man looking my executioners in the eye. Wallace took a seat in a chair positioned about 30 feet from a rundown shed where five shooters were in position. Just like Wallace requested, no hood was placed over his head. A small three-inch white target was pinned to his chest to signal where to aim. Wallace yelled out, aim for my heart, Marshall. Despite his calm facade, he was freaking out inside. He was not calm, cool, and collected like he wanted the crowd to believe. That was it. No further preparations were made. The Marshall yelled out, three, two, Wallace tightened his eyes shut and seized up his muscles in anticipation of the four bullets exploding through his chest. He clenched down his teeth and jaw and balled up his fists. All of his unconscious nervous movements shifted the target from its rightful position. That's right, not only did the marshal fail to implement restraints to keep him from moving, but he also did not supervise the placement of the target. It was not secure. At the count of one, the several shots melded together into one massive sonic boom. The frequency and tone reverberated through the bones of everyone there. The echo didn't slowly simmer into a buzzing silence like expected. Instead, a very disturbing and flailing commotion ensued from the chair. Still alive and in great distress, Wallace screamed out, Oh my god, they've missed. He leapt from the chair and collapsed onto the ground in a heap of quivering bone fragment and blood. One cartridge struck his upper arm, which completely shattered the bone. The poor placement of the target could not be blamed for this one. The other three pierced and lodged themselves in his upper torso beneath his heart. The prison doctors rushed to the broken, groaning man only to realize that they were powerless. Any help that they could offer him might save his life and after all, they were all gathered there to make sure that he didn't live to see another sunrise. All had very dismayed and tortured looks on their faces. They had never been in such a predicament before. They took an oath to do no harm, yet harm was the only thing that they were allowed to prescribe. It was decided that the execution would not be repeated. There was no way that Wallace would survive his injuries. He was losing blood. All internal organs were likely not spared, but if only that blood would gush just a little faster. He continued to wallow and cry out in pain. Any tiny movement that he took caused him to wince and yelp further, but it couldn't be helped. It appeared that he was stuck in a loop of involuntary seizing, possibly brought on by the immense rotten fire that was consuming his insides. He was clearly living in hell. Just imagine how the witnesses felt watching such a display. His animalistic screams became less and less human sounding. Wallace remained in that state, a bloody heap of human waste for 27 minutes before his heart finally gave out. His cause of death was exsanguination. He lost a huge chunk of his blood volume before his system finally gave out. Wallace went out this way because he was given a choice. It was either this, the guillotine, or hanging. Who would have ever guessed that those other two options would have been far more forgiving? On Halloween of 1938, there was an actual human experiment conducted during a firing squad execution and the results were both shocking and fascinating. The experiment is named after the condemned prisoner who was put to death. 40-year-old John Deering. 
John had a life of petty crime before escalating to full-blown violence. He murdered businessman Oliver R. Meredith in what appeared to be either a carjacking or robbery gone wrong. He shot the man using the same gun that he had used in a previous robbery, which got him caught. While in prison awaiting his fate of death, Deering appeared to feel remorse. He was a model prisoner who showed nothing but respect to the guards. When he was presented with the opportunity to depart the world, giving up invaluable information, he gladly accepted. He also made it clear that he wished to donate any organs possible to help people live a more fulfilled life. It's often hard to believe murderers when they exhibit sorrow and guilt, but Deering had nothing to gain. He was going to have a date with the firing squad, regardless of how he acted. It appears that he truly felt badly for his life of crime and robbing a man of his life. Deering had several meetings with Dr. Stephen Besley prior to his death date. Stephen walked him through what his plans were for his execution and why. Nothing that the doctor had planned would cause him extra discomfort. It was completely non-invasive and might simply delay the process a couple minutes at most. On October 30th, 1938, Deering was given a final meal of pheasant with all the fixins. He simply had never had a chance to try it before and wanted to have a bit of a food adventure before giving himself up to the ghost. He ate his last feast alongside his attorney, the chaplain, and prison warden. Together, they spoke of the events to come. They discussed the experiment, and Deering offered a small glimpse into his state of mind. From here on, I've got to be an actor. Nobody must know what goes on inside of me, he told them. It sounds to me like he was struggling with nerves, but didn't want to let them show. Not long after his meeting in Nosh, he headed to bed. Whether he was able to sleep a wink, nobody will know, but I sure as hell wouldn't be able to. The following day at 6.30 a.m., Deering was brought to a small chamber inside of Sugar House Prison. It was ambiently lit, but still had dark shadows casting all around the perimeter. Wool blankets were obstructing any daylight from invading. They were placed over the small windows to keep onlookers from sneaking a peek. Inside, there were already 75 witnesses waiting to watch the mad science experiment. Dr. Besley first placed electrodes on his wrist, which immediately began monitoring the electrical patterns of his heart. This was not done first by accident. The doctor wanted to see when the nerves really hit. At first, his heart rate held pretty steady at around 72 beats per minute. Next, Deering was asked to take a seat on a metal chair. His execution order was read aloud and a cue was given for him to speak his final words. He simply said, goodbye and good luck. Okay, let it go. Deering was restrained to the chair with tight straps. A small target was pinned to the cloth of his chest and a hood placed over his head. His heart rate quickly jumped from 72 to 180 beats per minute. He was obviously terrified. Not too far from him, but out of sight from witnesses, were five people armed with rifles lined up and waiting. Only one had a blank, but nobody knew who. Each was offered a daily wage of $50, which is worth just over a grand today. It was time to proceed. The marshal got himself into position and began the countdown to signal when to shoot. It took 22 seconds of anticipating, sweating, and heart racing before the fatal shots pierced his chest. Deering's heart immediately began to spasm. It was clearly penetrated by at least one cartridge. This went on for four seconds before releasing. After, it began to gradually slow to a stop. This took a total of 15.6 seconds, but Deering was still obviously alive. Dr. Besley expected this, at least for a few moments. There was no longer any activity being traced, yet he was still breathing and weakly fighting against his restraints. 30 seconds passed, and he was still moving. Dr. Besley kept his eyes on his watch, his surprise growing. One whole minute since his heart seized, and Deering was still breathing, making the faintest of whimpers. His brainstem was still working. It was still powering life-sustaining reflexes. His hindered movements and actions appeared to be at least partially conscious. Two minutes since his heart seized, and Deering's movements were slowing down. The life clearly close to being completely drained, but he was still in his body. He was still breathing. It wasn't until 134.4 seconds after his heart stopped that Deering was officially pronounced dead. And just like that, Dr. Pesley knew that they had the wrong idea about a gunshot to the heart being a near-immediate death. It wasn't over in moments. The brain appeared to have enough oxygen in reserve to continue firing for at least two minutes. Whether Deering was truly conscious and aware of that entire time remains unknown, though there were potential signs that he was. That would have required a study of brainwaves in addition to the heart in order to make a proper hypothesis. All in all, the execution was a success. The men with the rifles hit their target. After the fact, Dr. Besley held a press conference where he divulged that, despite Deering's bold and calm exterior, he was actually terrified to die. 
Later that same year, his study was featured on a popular true crime radio broadcast because, yes, people were even fascinated by it back then. That was when it hit the mainstream and became the talk of the general public. Now that you have a pretty good idea of how the human heart behaves when shot and the full procedure of the firing squad, let's get into the morbid stuff. How might something like this feel? Though there was no brain study done during the John Deering experiment, there have been quite a lot of brain studies conducted on people who were actively suffering cardiac arrest. After all, that is exactly what happens when a person dies from a gunshot wound to the heart. What these studies offered was that the brain did, in fact, continue firing for several minutes after death. The brainwave shifted over time. There was evidence that there was conscious actions and thoughts in the beginning. Some scientists who have been involved with these studies believe that the patient was in fact conscious for a time, but soon shifted into something that is now being called lucid dying. This could be the point when people experience their near-death experiences. You know, the typical seeing the white light or reuniting with loved ones. Though this has certainly not been proven definitively, it's an interesting take. This completely disproves the old saying that if during the firing squad you hear the gunshots, that means that they have missed. You will, no doubt, hear those gunshots. After, the only thing that you will likely hear is a high-pitched ringing. Based on the many studies that I have read, my personal hypothesis is that you would have an average of 10 to 15 seconds of consciousness after the heart stops beating. Another reason why I believe this is because there was an officer who was shot in the heart on the line of duty, but was still able to draw her gun, turn around, and run before falling to the ground after. 10 to 15 seconds leaves you completely vulnerable to feeling the force of the bullets penetrating your flesh there's a high likelihood that it would cause complete and often shattering fractures to certain rib bones, including the sternum. The agony would be a little delayed. You would feel your body fly backwards against the metal chair, but the electrical and explosion-like pain would well up in the first few seconds. It would crescendo into an all-consuming fire raging deep within your torso and it would shoot out into every direction. It would invade your esophagus, your sides, your upper and lower back, and even your jaw. Just the speed of the cartridges tearing through your tissue along with its metal make would generate a serious amount of heat. Even if you remove the sheer force of it, that heat alone would feel as if you're being branded with molten metal from the outside in. It would grow and grow and grow until you desperately yearn for something to extinguish the, what feels like, still burning fire. It would become maddening. It would reach a frenzy that would round out with a raw ripping. These sensations could be why Deering was whimpering and struggling against his restraints initially. On top of all that, and it is possible that you may not even be very in tune with it, but the spasm of your heart would feel incredibly awkward. As a person who was born with an electrical issue with my own heart, I would imagine that it feels similar to episodes that I have experienced. It's as if my heart is dancing and climbing up my throat, like I'm about to vomit it up. It also feels very much like I'm being electrocuted, only it's localized to my torso and chest. Considering that Deering's heart only spasmed for four seconds, he may have been too preoccupied with the force of the shots throwing his body hard into the metal to even notice. As horrific as this description sounds, the suffering would still likely be over in just seconds. Half a minute at most. It may not sound like the most humane execution method, but I assure you it is typically far better than the other options. The electric chair and gas chamber can cause suffering for 2 to even 15 times that amount of time. I will also remind you that the firing squad has zero incidents of going wrong in modern times. Thank you all so much for still being here and watching this video despite my huge gap in time between uploads. I am so sorry about that. I moved and then I had a lot of issues with equipment and it was just a whole thing. I am hopeful though that I will be returning to my normal upload schedule from here. And of course, please leave any requests below in the comments. It can be any type of death or even ancient execution methods. I have now covered just about every modern method with the exception of one new one, which will be coming. So soon I can get into the really cringe-inducing, brutal old methods.